This week on Around the Coin, we interviewed Ohad Samit. Ohad has an amazing background. He's currently the CEO and founder of True Accord. True Accord helps companies collect debt from clients. A huge business, $14 billion, an industry that hasn't been touched in decades, and the company is on a rocket ship. They just raised a big Series A round and We learn all about how the company got started, his brother who worked in the Israeli Special Operations Division. Previous to that, Ohad worked for, he was a first employee or first couple employees at Fraud Analysis. Back in 2008, they were acquired by PayPal for over $160 million. And he stayed at PayPal for a couple years and ran their, uh, was part of their risk analysis team, risk analytics team. And... Then he started a company called Signified, which was acquired by Klarna. And along the same thread, he was working in risk analysis. Now with True Accord, you could look at this as this is one of those guys that has probably the best track record in the world to start a company like True Accord. And we learn how the company got started, where they're at now, where they're going. Just a truly remarkable story from an industry of debt collection that no one really finds particularly interesting. But because of that, you know, I shouldn't say no one, but because of the the lack of interest traditionally in the industry, they're just so much low hanging fruit and such an opportunity to build a massive, really impactful business. So we learn a lot from from Ohad. Um, hope you enjoy. Thanks. All right, guys, we have Ohad Samit. Is that how I pronounce it? Samit. Samit on the show, the CEO of True Accord. Uh, we have Brian Faisal and myself, Mike Townsend here. Um, Ohad, we're really excited to have you on. Thanks for, here. Thanks for being here. Um, how's everyone yeah, doing thanks today? Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Wonderful? Wonderful. That's great. That's great. Uh, Ohad, so I'd love to hear the high level. How'd you get started? The background is, is incredibly fascinating. Um, why don't you just jump right in and tell us how what True Accord is and, and how you got started on the company. Sure. Um, True Accord was actually the combination of both a personal experience in that collection and more of a top-down realization that something is, there's a big potential here in the industry. Um, my last role was a chief uh, risk officer for Klarna. It's a European payments company doing buy now, pay later. Um, it, it basically, this is short-term lending, uh, just without the lending. If people pay on time, they, they just get the product. Um, and I, I realized that a lot of the problems that uh, I've been dealing with in, in almost a decade in machine learning for financial services and risk management and fraud prevention um, can translate very, very well into debt collection. And whenever I try to do something like that, either with the internal team or, or external um, vendors, the response is always very um, um, suspicious or suspecting, <laughs> meaning pe- people people were not really con- uh, used to the idea of technology and debt collection. Uh, we're very fixed on collection as a, person-to-person operation. You have to get people on the, on the phone. Any technology that you use needs to be leveraged to, to get people to call in. And that, that, that just didn't sound right. Um, so that was it. And I also, by studying the way lending worked and the way Klarna worked, I realized that there's, I felt like the industry was looking at the collection process the wrong way. Um, was looking at debt collection in a very transactional way. Uh, there's debt, and I am going to, there's, there's probably some competition on the limited number of dollars you, the consumer, have in your pocket. And it's a sprint, and we need to get as much dollars, as many dollars as possible from your pocket to our pocket before you go bankrupt or before you stop communicating with us. And it, that, it just seemed wrong. It seemed like there was a potential for a partnership here, for some kind of relationship building that, yeah, it starts from a really bad situation where somebody lost trust with their creditor, with the company they owe money to. Um, they're not super interested in talking. They know they owe money or they're really angry at a service they didn't get. But there was potential to to do some retention work and just create a relationship here and, and carry that re- relationship going forward not only recovering the the money at hand but also 
having additional revenue streams. So it seemed like a big opportunity. And, and, and along that time, I forgot to pay um, my, my Macy's card. Some notice I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm paperless, so I didn't get the email, didn't pay it. Started getting phone calls from unidentified uh, phone numbers or phone numbers that I didn't know. Didn't answer in the, in the beginning. And then after about a week or two where I got a phone call every morning, 8.20 a.m., I realized something was up. <laughs> By that time, I started realizing, like, I knew the FTCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act already because I was doing the research. I, I figured something was going on. Picked up the phone. And this IVR is saying, uh, your call is important to us. Please stay on the line. With no indication for you know, who it is, what are they doing, why are they calling me, uh, which now I know is a way to, to reduce abandon rates in uh, power dialing and debt collection. Eventually, after a few hangups, et cetera, I stayed on the line. And then somebody came on, on the line, and she was very aggressive, um, trying to get me to pay immediately. And I said, no problem. I have the money. I want to pay with a credit card. She said, no problem. $15 convenience fee, <laughs> which was obviously not acceptable. I said, okay, I'll pay with a bank with a wire. Great. Let's do this now. I have my checkbook. And so you get the point. Like It was inconvenient. It was confrontational. It was, it was a lot of hidden fees. It was just not a good experience. So both from a personal perspective and from a market opportunity, there was a big thing here, and we started investigating, my co-founders and I. We realized that really there's a huge opportunity here. It's an industry that makes 13 to $14 million a year in revenue in the U.S. alone, but it's also very fragmented. Thousands and thousands of companies, um, the top five companies, have about 20% of the market. So um, we realized there was a big opportunity here uh, to introduce technology, to introduce a different paradigm, and we started working. Hmm. Now, uh, Ohad, how long ago was that? How, how, how many years ago? Oh, we started working on Trocord as a project um, in the beginning of 2013. Wow. So kind of nights and weekends. Um, and did you and know then, your... Did you, uh, go ahead. Well, we, we, uh, we got Odesk uh, to experiment with us um, mid last year. So it was about... Uh, it was uh, May of 2013. And right off the bat, it worked very, very well. And how did you, so, uh, how did you come, come across your co-founders? Did you know them beforehand? Uh, were they yeah, friends of uh, yours? It's, it's, a, it's a funny story. So one of them is, is my brother. Um, my previous company, Analyze, it got acquired. I started with my other brother, who now runs product for Klarna for, for a few years already. Um, so kind of turned out to be good, but, um, but in addition, he is, um, ex Israeli intelligence forces. So he really understands data collection and classification, which is a capability we really needed for our platform. So that's one co-founder and the other one, um, Nadav is our CTO and he's, uh, an ex senior engineer in Google, someone I've known for a while. We always wanted to work together. So, um, and luckily, he was available when I was starting to look for a team. We banded together and started working. Wow. Now, now Ohad, I got to ask this, and I, I kind of know it, but I think we want to put this out there. Why is it that Israel has done so well with this sort of intelligence? Every time I find anybody brilliant in in uh, finance or debt collection algorithms and, and, and such, what is the... Um, What's the reason? Is there an inception company like Fairchild starting the Silicon Valley? Was there a company that sort of started this in Israel? Well, um, you could call it a company. There's a unit in the Israeli intelligence forces that has a really interesting approach towards uh, signal intelligence, SIGINT. So detecting sure. terrorist activity on the internet, on mobile communication, on any type of, of signal communication. And... Um, the way they they built their automation processes, uh, the way they they built domain expert based systems, really lends itself very well to areas where there there's lack of efficiency because nobody ever looked at automating complex human decisions. Ah, hmm. I love so it. in a sense, all of the companies, fraud sciences that, that yeah, yeah, fraud. You know, we we basically learn from that experience and, and translate it into fraud prevention, 
uh, the way we took it and, and analyzed it and Klarna translated it into uh, credit, lend- credit granting to some extent. Wonga uses this process. Um, a bunch of other companies. It, it's just the the. It's less of a know-how specifically about you know how to grant credit or how to prevent fraud or how to do that collection. It's more of a really robust process to take the decisions from individuals. It's from human beings making complex decisions and translating them into uh, machine learning. So that's that's kind of how Powerful the knowledge stuff. flows. Now, how does the traditional traditional uh, debt collection industry observe you? Have you had any interactions with them uh, thus far? Nothing direct. I think there's always... Um, <laughs> I, I, I went to a, a debt collection conference last oh year, <laughs> last summer, and I was, I was naive. I brought a suit, and it was a really different... Population I've been, denied. I've been to one, uh, actually two before, and I okay. got to tell you, it was very uncomfortable for me. <laughs> Some of the characters that you run into are interesting, especially yes. the junk debt buyers. You know, the, the guys that buy the junk debt is has always fascinated me. So I didn't run into these guys, uh, fortunately, but, but, you know, I wouldn't say shady characters, but definitely a lot of family-owned businesses, a lot of work-from-home folks. Yes. A lot of people who looked like they were coming to the beach. Uh, <laughs> it was, it, it struck me, it struck me because, you know, people in the debt collection industry, people who touch debt, we influence people's lives. We're a major s- source of stress for people if we mismanage the process. And then I saw, there I saw pe- people where I actually listened in on a discussion on how to stall a consumer's lawyer when they try to get oh information God. from you to sue you. And I, I, I was just, I was uncomfortable. Wow. So when, and you know, put that aside, I mean, a lot of people in the debt collection industry are super professional, uh, but also very conservative. And they've learned because there's a little bit of a perversion in, in debt collection, like a lot of highly regulated areas. There's this whole area of things that are, highly, highly litigated. You make a mistake, you put one character in the wrong place, you get sued. There was a company uh, that lost a judgment about a month ago because they had the, they sent a letter and the letter, the actual envelope had a window and the window had the consumer's account number. And the judge ruled that that was third party disclosure. That was disclosing to others that this person had um, a debt um, so that's highly, highly litigated. On the other hand, there's this whole space of what happens um, within uh, when when a consumer gets a notice and they need to dispute the debt, and that's a really difficult process for the consumer, and they don't know enough about it. And a lot of uh, collectors are leveraging that. There's a lot of uh, leveraging the, the knowledge arbitrage to work against the consumers. So it's a really strange field, and yeah. So Ohad, what 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 is the uh, what's the kind of magic sauce or the experience behind the scenes that True Accord provides? You know, when I when I go to trueaccord.com and I go through the process, like what's happening behind the scenes that that is such a unique experience? So there are two things here beyond the fact that. Um, we're moving online to where consumers want to be and we're moving into digital communication and online communication and so on. That's, that's table stakes, although if you look at debt collection in general, in the industry, that just doesn't exist. Really? Yeah. Uh, but if we talk about the, the secret sauce, it's in two places. One, our ability to, to draw from multiple data sources online and create a, more, a much uh, richer profile for you as a as a, a consumer who's in debt and understand your preferences or predict your preferences and uh, how you'd rather be spoken to, what is most probably your problem, why are you not paying, because there could be many, and like what is the right way to approach you. So there's a lot that goes into that. Um, that's one. And the second point is that our system learns from your behavior. So... Um, based on the emails you open, the emails you read, the pages you visit, what you click, how often, where do you drop off, 
Um, so, so what on. kind of stuff do you learn from that? So if someone keeps clicking an email, they keep coming back to the site, are they more likely to pay or are they nervous? Do you think, do you look at like psychologies of, of users and, and try to group those together? We definitely try to group uh, people together by their, their psychology, not more of their, more their disposition, right? If someone is overwhelmed versus someone is trying to be very casual versus someone is very formal and angry. Uh, there, we need to respond to their to their disposition, uh, and part of that is is the way you open email. So if you open an email multiple times, even if you don't click, once you open it one, more than twice, you are engaged with that specific email. It touched you in a certain way. Now, do you think do you uh, think do you think people would be uh, against just telling you? Do you have a little drop down that says, uh, "I actually used Airbnb last week, and I was impressed by the little product that had a drop down." It says, "How are you feeling?" Yeah. And I thought that was a create that was a that was a that was an interesting little product. Um, do you have one of those on on various parts, or can people give you their emotions explicitly? Like a, from people a can product can tell us explicitly how they are and what they want. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, when, when I, had, I had no. a question regarding your debt. Are you, you're not buying debt, are you? You just we're not waiting no, we're for servicing so, it. People who are coming to you and say, "Listen, I have a debt problem, and I'd like no. you to solve it amicably." Actually, uh, we are we are a B two B to C operation, right? So, so we sell our services to the creditor, but we service the debt rather than buy it and have it in our books. Which, okay. which actually is probably making you operate in a much different manner than if you owned so, it. So, so let's say I, yeah. I, I have a debt of a certain company uh, which you have never interacted before and I contact you and then you will contact my creditor and then establish a relationship and say, listen, I'm going to work with this person and get your money back. Is that it? So, so we definitely want to get there at a certain point because we believe it will be much better for the consumer than anyone else. But right now what we do is we go to the company we go to Odesk, uh, for example. Odesk. We go to yeah. WePay. We go to potentially, you know, a, a bank, a lending mm-hmm. club, and we sell their our service to them. And what they do is, after they're done with their internal process, they assign it to us. They don't sell it to us. They basically say, "We're done. Mm-hmm. Now is your turn. It's still in our books, but this now is your turn." And we start communicating with the customer. That's that's actually one of the models that is pretty common in debt collection. Industry. That's a third. No. So, you're, so you're very program. passive. Uh, you're very passive as far as a customer is concerned. You're not. You're not proactive. You're not taking someone else's assigned debt to you and then going reaching out to them. Correct. No. Correct. We're not doing that right now. Now, now, Ohad, that whole uh, aging process. It, Maybe update listeners who may not know. In a typical situation, let's just say it's um, it's a credit card uh, amount of a thousand dollars that somebody didn't pay. How long is that aged, and when would it, it typically would it drop into your life cycle, and when would you like it to drop into, and how long would you keep it before it gets passed on? Right. Um, so usually in debt collection, we talk about primary, secondary, and ter- tertiary placements. Sure. Um, and they're divided. Uh, they're divided not strictly, uh, mostly, um, but thirty to ninety days after uh, the the debt has been deemed in default. So the first thirty days, there's a init- internal handling, and then it's being it's placed with a debt collection agency, and then um, on ninety days. It's usually charged off, then it moves into secondary placement where a little bit more aggressive debt collectors. And then uh, in about 180 days to a year, it gets into uh, tertiary placement where most often it's being sold. Now, there's, there's, no stand, there's no complete standardization of the process, right? So some of the customers we work with have never worked with a collection agency before because they never found a collection agency they're comfortable with or uh, they haven't uh, they worked with a collection agency and it didn't work out and now they're working with us and it works better for them so in their case they just assign everything to us after a few weeks of them doing something internally and then it sits with us forever because they don't want to sue their customers they don't want to sell them off they really care about about user experience yeah this is what i was getting to because i really think that we're seeing a modern paradigm shift especially with startups 
and uh, and especially B two B where you don't really want to upset a future because I, I don't know if you're doing business to business collection, but uh, uh, that's very touchy because if you're trying to collect, you could potentially injure a long term relationship. But yep. moving on to banks, I mean. If you're successful in the way I think you are, which, by the way, I think you have an incredibly brilliant product here, absolutely brilliant, and it's uh, I, it's got a long life. But at some point, I would imagine that the internal efforts that we see, even within banks, are not even close to what you're talking about. I mean, they are using essentially a shotgun to take a fly out, you know, and uh, uh, the Dunning phone calls on some banks start within two weeks past... Um, Past due. And sometimes it actually causes, in my mind, uh, the consumer to hyper respond and shut down. And uh, so you see it someday, sometime in the future that you might even be early on in the cycle where something goes past a certain mark that your techniques and, and powers would take over? Well, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is yes, we absolutely want to go there and we absolutely want to see how, what's the right way to partner with banks. Um, the long answer is, you know, we'll have to touch upon how regulation is changing and what the CFPB is doing and how the industry is changing. I, I agree with you that there's there's a change, um, but in some areas it's a little bit slow, and it remains to be seen if the if the banks and other financial institutions are going to change on their own, with the help of companies like True Accord that are really rethinking this paradigm, or they're going to be forced to change through enforcement. So, so. Uh, uh where do you think it's going to go sort of long term? Like what's the, if you look at the current state of, of new technology coming out with, you know, just dis, the digitalization with Apple Pay being one of the, the forefronts here, what's the long term change? You know, where is True Accord or just the debt industry long term down the road? I mean, what does it look like? Is it, is it even the similar kind of experience on the consumer side? Well, let me frame that. Listen, the debt collection industry, there's a reason why I went there. I went there because nobody touched it for decades and decades. The debt collection industry doesn't care about Apple Pay. 40 to 50% of the debt collectors in the market right now don't accept credit cards online. Yeah. They've heard about the internet, you know, it's something their kids do. Hmm. Or their grandkids we're talking about an industry that is behind in so many ways. It is, you know, uh, Apple Pay. I mean, let, let's talk about Braintree. I mean, let's yeah. talk about PayPal. You know, you can't really accept that uh, th because of credit card regulations. You, you have to work with specific providers. Mm -hmm. So where do I think, where are we taking it? We're taking it to the 21st century. We're taking it to online uh, communication. We're talking, taking it to emails, text messages, and IM. We're taking it to uh, an online dashboard that provides transparency and clarity of, of the process. We're, we're moving to alternative payment methods and collaboration. We're doing all of these things that work at scale and that only startups can think about. And we're seeing very interesting reception. Hmm. Now, you're, you're working directly to try to improve the credit score of the consumer. Isn't that one of the the, the things that you hold out there that you're going to make them more upstanding in the future, it's sort of a recovery program in a sense. We definitely want to go, look, before the credit report, there's, there's financial education. Uh, sure. We see consumers that end up in debt because they consistently make bad financial decisions. And one of the bad financial decisions that they make is when they're in debt, they, it takes them a long time to talk to us. So first and foremost, True Accord is about getting people who would otherwise not talk to you to talk to you. Our, our emails have 20, 25% open rate. This is almost double the industry. Um, we get people to respond and we understand their psychology and we're able to segment them to hyper-personalize the experience. That is first and wow. foremost, understanding psychology. And then after we get to that point, we will start, we're, we're very gently starting to investigate how to offer solutions that go deeper, like you said. You know, I'll have, we had a, a gentleman on who runs uh, Lend Up, and yep. the, the two of you are, just seem to be going down the same road of shedding light on an, a sector of industry that 
really just was a dark alley in most ways. And uh, I see this convergence, especially with the younger generation. Uh, you know, let's say uh, people below the age of 25, their relationship with banks are dramatically changing. And in a sense, I see you part of the new banking system. As, as strange as it might see about you know, on the, you're on the, the debt collection side, I think people get to that side because they weren't educated in this modern context of, of what credit really is, what debit, uh, debt is. And, and, you know, companies like LendUp are trying to find ways, you know, a transmission breaks on your car, you don't have $3,000. Well, mm-hmm. your payday loan uh, with the proper type of payday loan that is actually giving you uh, you know, uh, a credit reporting and and a way to move forward. These things are brilliant. Do you see a sort of new convergence of a banking system that's formed around a lot of the uh, algorithmic models that you guys are are working on? Because I really think you're inventing a new industry as we speak. It's like rocket science here, you know? I think, um, first of all, I really appreciate Sasha and Lendup and, and Jacob yeah. and everything that they're doing. And it's a company we're, we're excited uh, to work with. I guess we'll get to that point uh, in the future where we work together. Um, I think it's a little bit too early to talk about all of us as part of, a, of an ecosystem that, you know, we're not touching our, in, in, the, in the Venn diagram, we're not even, our circles are not touching yet. We need to expand, we need to grow um, the boundaries of what we're solving. But if you look at, you know, the, the, the investor and founder community in hardcore financial services outside of commerce and payments is very small and very tightly knit and we talk yeah. a lot. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I'm sure we'll connect. I mean, for me, like LendUp, um, debt collectors used to be the ones that kick you in the ass on your way out as you're being ejected out of the yeah. standard banking industry. We kind of want to be a safety net or a trampoline or call what you mean, you know, the one that catches you and help you helps you bounce back um, <laughs> Love that as long analogy. as you want Yeah, to. that's beautiful. Now, are, so obviously you're training a lot in the psychology of, of the way people are going to respond. Yeah. Uh, have you, are there any insights that you can share that you've discovered thus far about, you know, consumers that may have been contradictory to what people generally assume? Um, well, without revealing secrets, but I'm sure you're getting these insights. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this first and foremost, um, when debt collection is discussed, people tend to make gross generalizations. Debtors are either debt meets or victims. (laughs) And it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, the, the debtor community or the community of customers who are in debt right now, uh, we, we try very hard to not call them debtors uh, and because we feel it's judgmental, but the, the community of people who are in debt is incredibly diverse. There are the people who um, disagree with the charge. There are people who are overwhelmed with their lives. There are people who make bad decisions because they're consistently making them or because they're young and they don't understand the implications. Um, there are people who are very rational about being in debt because that's how they manage their finances. So um, we've discovered a lot of, uh, I actually just gave a, a, a webinar about how to, for example, use um, reciprocity with, with customers who don't pay because they feel they've been wronged by the company, by the creditor. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, so how, how did you surmise that? Because this is the, the, the repudiation, because I've seen this in the credit card industry so long, so many chargebacks are just because, you know, the color was off from what I saw on the web right. and they didn't want to give me 10% off. You know, that's sort of just feeling like they got something because of it, you know, complaining to the manager at the store kind of thing. So exactly. you're seeing that. Uh, so what, what did you come to as a conclusion? Is it modern age? How do we do, I mean, does the... Does the company want to come back? Because some companies are very steadfast. We sold it for $199. That's what they got. And, and, uh, and they owe me $199. Whereas you can maybe come in the middle and say, hold on. The guy was just mad about this. Give him five bucks and you know, go away. Give him a $5 discount. Uh, I mean, do you get to that level of negotiating? Yes. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And are there, well, are, are there are there people that you guys employ? Like, wh- is there an army of people that have been trained by True Accord to make phone calls for you know on behalf of True Accord for the company that you're working for? No, not an army. 
Uh, <laughs> the, less, the less phone calls, the better, right? Less your than mom. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's there's a small team of incredibly proficient customer engagement specialists. Mm-hmm. We don't call them collectors, and they're not collectors, and they're not compensated for collections. Um, whose job is to actually engage with customers when they call in or when uh, we need to call out to them. Um, we are incredibly automated. Right now, we're about 10x more automated than a standard collection agency in the sense that uh, the number of cases that an, an individual customer care or customer engagement specialist can handle, and we're continuously automating more. About 95% of our communication is completely automated. Somebody gets an email or a text message or even a letter. They go to a, a link. They click a few buttons. They tell us what's up. They negotiate with us. Done. Um, but in these cases where we need to learn, and that goes back again to that, that methodology from the Israel Intelligence Forces, um, these people, these customer engagement team, uh, the specialists, they talk to individuals, they understand, they find new patterns, and that then our analytics team co- comes in, understands how to automate that, and adds that into the algorithm. Now, c- could I ask... Um, in, in some circumstances, are you given the ability to offer um, reconcilable, uh, you know, discounts, like in a sense that not somebody's complaining, but you're kind of looking at their credit profile and you figure, well, my algorithms say that we could probably get 90, 85, 65% uh, payment on this and let's just go there instead of trying to push for 100% like some debt collection services would. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely we're definitely um, we negotiate a collection strategy with our clients, and they give us permission to sometimes pro- grant discounts when we feel like it's the right thing to do. And and, and Ohad, how is the uh, how is the international spectrum? Is it is it purely U.S. based? Is there any restriction to the U.S.? I know you're in previous before we started the show. You're in Stockholm now. Your team is is from uh, Israel or has been in the Israel uh, forces. Is there geographic areas you guys focus on, or how do you think about growth internationally in different parts of the world? We focus on the U.S. Uh, we focus on well. Debt collection, again, you have to be licensed um, state by state in the U.S. and sometimes city by city. So um, we, we focus on areas where we can operate um, and, and not you know, break laws. Um, we definitely want to expand. But first, I mean, there's a huge opportunity in the U.S. Um, there's also a lot of challenges from a regulatory perspective. Um, we may go to other territories with our customers that are really interested in taking us internationally. Uh, we may not. I mean, it's a little bit too early for us to commit to that. Wow. You know, I, one, one point I might make, I've been around the check guarantee business for many, many decades. And the thing I, I discovered is, and this is before this was really even highly computerized, is that some of the old guys that were in this business were able to identify about 16 basic character archetypes of people that would write bad checks. Mm -hmm. And that would be built into their algorithms of guaranteeing checks. And the beauty of the check guarantee business and its high, di- you know, its highlights, uh, you know, telecheck, et cetera, it's obviously not the same as it was uh, a couple of decades ago, was uh, companies like telecheck were making an enormous amount of money on people who were repeat offenders uh, in a sense that they constantly were writing bad checks and constantly paying them off. And um, they would let those checks go through with 100% guarantee because they would see them in their system week in, week out, month in, groceries, uh, you know, the chiropractor, whatever. Mm -hmm. And do you think that you might discover the chronic debtor in the same sense? Is this psychology moving into the modern age uh, from check guarantee into this type of thing? Um, I am sure. I mean, we already see people who, um, and I'm not a psychologist, but... uh, you know, it looks it looks as though some people are, are are addicted to this situation. They're in it in a way that is there's some pull yeah. on them in, in in being in debt and in just consuming more. 
Um, it's a little bit too early for me to be all philosophical about, you know, the, the debt situation, consumerism, etc. But we're definitely seeing um, some some difficult um, proof for yeah, that to the, for know, the problem. You know, Ohad, when I was researching it back in that era, and I actually talked to some of these people and uh, and got a little closer to their situation, a lot of them had more than enough money available. Uh, it, it really came down to some sort of psychological reinforcement. It was a, it was almost like a barrier to, so that they they felt guilty spending money, uh, mm. that kind of thing. And it, it was more pervasive. You know, I, I approached it like a scientist. I figured, you know, this is probably a, an outlier scenario. It was more pervasive than I, I could have ever realized. It was uh, double digits and it was growing uh, up until that point. Uh, so, and I, obviously I know it from my colleagues in the, in the credit card issuing side of the banks uh, that, they live on these, um, uh, you know, overage fees and convenience fees and, and things like that. Uh, at any given moment, 65% of cards in circulation is being hit with some late fee or some uh, account over fee or something that was unrelated to the normal behavior of the credit card user. And they go on. It's not like it's an end event. It just is an income opportunity. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why the government jumped in here because they started shortening the... Uh, uh, shortening the period, the, the late periods. I mean, the grace periods used to be back in the uh, early days, uh, uh, up to 91 days. Uh, the 61 days for some cards, some charge cards had 91 days. The old diners club, for example, you could really get by without getting a ding on your credit report or paying anything. Uh, that got mm -hmm. shortened. But I think uh, after the 2008 crash, they knocked some of these things down to 15 days, 14 days, 12 days. And uh, and then they had that unilateral increase of your uh, your rate, you know you would have a five percent card go to twenty eight percent, you know, because you're you're two days late on your payment and most people didn't know it, you know. Mm -hmm. So they they they're now their their meals are now being charged at a twenty eight percent and they're paying their minimum fees, so they'll be paying for decades. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, so Ohad, um, one thing I, I wish I asked earlier, where, where is the state of True Accord in terms of whatever you can reveal in terms of the number of customers, the interesting customers, um, revenue size? Um, how, like, where, where, where are you guys? Um, so I can talk a lot about our customers. Um, we, we're working with WePay. We're working with the firm. Uh, we're working with uh, Kiva, Zip. Awesome. Um, and... Uh, we're, we're expanding in the uh, in the in the tech sector with companies that really, like we said, care about their customers but also want to get paid. Um, we're talking to a few uh, larger companies now. With with the launch, we've been noticed by a few larger financial institutions that really want to ch try our product. Um, so, larger larger customers. We have a little bit more than twenty customers. The majority of them. Uh, large companies. We have almost $20 million under management right now. Wow. Um, revenues are, uh, we're, we're not talking about revenues, but, uh, but, but they're growing. So I'm not complaining. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you see mm. yourself white labeling this in growth? I mean, would, or would the model change? Because obviously scalability, if you wind up getting a Citibank or a Chase Bank highly active, I mean, they're probably going to want to take a lot of your techniques and just white label it internally. Is that part of the model? We're not necessarily against it. Um, I think the, you know, the the ability to sustain relationships is in, in, and turn into a consumer brand is a little bit limited when you're white labeling. But yeah, um, it could be that with regulation, with sensitivity around compliance, that's going to be one of our of our avenues of of working with the large banks. Absolutely. Ohad, uh, what's the what's your view on the competition? I mean, is do do you? Th do you fear that they'll copy your model, or do you have a secret sauce because of how, of how you profile and you uh, your engagement process with the customers that you know that you feel that you're safe? Well, um, I'll tell you this: when um, when Fraud Sciences got acquired by PayPal in 2008, we got acquired uh, because our models were up to 17 percent better than PayPal's models at the time. Yeah. So wow. not all of our models, not all of the time. PayPal, you know, did an incredible, incredibly good job, but up to 17% in, in some of the segments. PayPal at the time had about, I want to say, 3 million transactions a day. Um, Fraud Sciences had 60,000 transactions lifetime. 
Wow. Hmm. And all the wow. lifestyle of the company. Now, so, you moved into PayPal after that. Well, you yeah. Were, was, so you were in the belly of the beast, if we can uh, transition a little <laughs> here. Um, what did you see inside of that company at that epoch and that era? Because you really brought, I, in my view, an incredible paradigm shift in their ability to an, analyze uh, risk. Because prior to that, they were really kind of running um, kind of roughshod on some of their uh, risk management techniques. Yeah, I mean, just just to complete my answer to, to Faisal, I think there's a, there's a unique approach here that we're presenting that it's not easily um, replicable, and that mm -hmm. is what True Accord is bringing yeah. to the market, and why we're going to have um, upside over any other company, and it's going to be difficult to copy what we do. Um, and I think PayPal discovered it the same as as PayPal scaled. Um, you know, the early team, Max, and, and people who worked for him, they pr practically invented random force. They yeah. invented a lot of things that they had that had to be built to, to prevent fraud. But as, as PayPal scaled, you can't scale uh, with, with just hiring, you know, smart, creative people and see what they can figure out in, mm. in machine learning. So uh, they continued hiring people from, you know, from Fair Isaac, from a lot of people who did... Uh, frequentist st uh, statistics and built models in a very specific way. Um, I think with a lot of people who were there at the time, we helped pioneer looking at behaviors, uh, doing it behavioral, um, using behavioral analytics, using um, Bayesian statistics, and being able to look at a problem with just a broader tool set. Um, if you look back, I mean, nowadays the ARS team, the the, the X fraud science fraud science team, basically leads the uh, risk management team at PayPal. So I guess it was a good acquisition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you do you question. see? Does uh, True Accord see any patents on the way? We have uh, one provisional patent already. Very good. Um, Very good. Can you talk for, about that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, our system, basically the, the system that learns and adapts to consumers' behavior, we call it Heartbeat because it, uh, it really looks at, our, at, the, at the customers every, uh, with every heartbeat, uh, every few hours. Um, that's the patent and piece. It's a, it's a really complex state machine that looks at customers' behaviors and responds to them and prioritizes how do we, con do we contact them, how do we contact them, to what channel, with what copy, uh, based on their behavior, and really continuously updates the classification of uh, why they're not paying and how we should talk wow. to them. Wow. Now, hold it, hold it. So you're essentially, in real time, grabbing all sorts of social signals and coagulating them into one central area and sort of ascertaining value of that signal and w the, some of the behaviors? Is that what this patent is really basically saying? Yes. Uh, well, some is real time and some is, is not real time. We have the, the uh, luxury, actually, of, of being able to work not completely real time. But yeah, that's exactly it. So hold it. If I was a merchant, I was selling a, a, an item that has a high risk of being um, charged back, for example. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that data be uh, a way for me to decide whether I want to do business with that customer uh, pre facto rather than ex post facto in, in the collection environment? It's possible, but uh, there are two caveats here. One is that all of our models are trained on people who have actually not paid. So there's a, there's a prior here. Gotcha. That the person is defaulted. So it's really difficult to say what it's going to do with people whom we don't know have defaulted already. Mm. Um, and but you would obviously is, go ahead. No, I mean the second point is that it's such a crowded market. We would we would not want to compete there. We're yeah. very good where we are. Gotcha, gotcha. So, yeah. so what sort of what sort of signals are you looking at? I mean, as an example, as a singular example. I mean, if if someone is tweeting uh, in good spirits or bad spirits, is that something that you pick up? Um, Single word tokenization of tweets to understand people's disposition is definitely <laughs> part of the things wow. that we're looking at. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. And That's are, are, are you, I, I got to ask this, are you getting like these guys that are blinging out, look at the new watch, look at the uh, new iPhone, and then you realize that this guy's <laughs> got, you know, a, a $5,000 he's, he's worth hunting down. 
I mean, so what, what kind of signal is that? Because now we're going into the deep psychology of people. Because obviously, if you have somebody who's, let's just call them a show off, and yep. they're deeply in debt, th that is a clear psychological signal right there, right? And mm -hmm. uh, so that sets off alarms in your system uh, at this point? Well, I wouldn't call it alarms, but it really helps us understand that, uh, that this is a person who really cares about appearances, right? Um, so versus profile someone, better. Yeah, we understand better. I mean, p part, of the, part of the sophistication of the system is to be able to use data sources that are only present a part of the time, signals that are only present a part of the time. Right? Interesting. So not everybody, not everybody has a Twitter feed. Not everybody has something very obvious in their Twitter feed. So mm. how do you act when there is a Twitter feed and the Twitter feed is predominantly, obviously, is obsessed with money or is obsessed with religion or is obsessed with something else. Um, and that's part of the sophistication. Uh, is there any image, so, can I ask any image recognition that you're using? Because I think we're getting so photographic and in like Instagram, for example, are you trying to go that far? Because I know Israeli intelligence is probably leading the world in image recognition. So I, Yeah, um, not yet. There's so much to be done in, in core, uh, in, in the core indicators that we have now. Wow. And learning from people's behavior on our platform, uh, we yeah. may get there. We may get to you know NLP in in yeah. responding to people's freeform uh, emails to us. Um, I'm not ruling that out, but um, but wow. I I am a bread and butter kind of guy. We in Klarna on a 2.5 billion dollar portfolio, so 2.5 billion dollar in, in annual payments and and lend and uh, loans. Um, we reach 84 basis points in losses. Wow. And I had no we, idea. And we did that with very good um, feature engineering, but only logistic regression. We didn't use any neural networks. We didn't use any Bayesian networks You're because me. they. Well, they create a black box effect, right? You don't really understand how you got to a certain um, uh, result, and then you can't really uh, improve it. So it was more about layering very precise models, wow. predicting specific behaviors, than using the most swanky algorithms. Now and I'm really blown it, away. I, I, first off, I thought the numbers were much higher. I had not known it's that low. And uh, yeah. wow. So th th I, again, that's probably why they're scaling to the U.S. apparently, right? They're, they're looking at aggressively moving into the U.S. market finally. Yeah, so. we've been... Uh, so, so, so Oha, if, if, if I'm... You know, Faisal and I actively use Twitter. Brian doesn't. Um, mm. All I of us tweet. aren't. There's and, a tweet uh, up there. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> it's questionable. I don't so know. You know, well, you so know the, Mike, we got to stop tweeting about the watch. I know. So now, <laughs> now I'm wondering, like, if from a from a user's perspective, is it potentially harmful to me in the future if I incur debt to have this public uh, portfolio? You could say, does that you know would that work against me in your assessment? Well, uh, define against. Yeah, right? I guess. So, um, if you plan to be in debt and you never want to talk to anyone, there are, there are legal mechanisms to allow you to unsubscribe from everything, give your collectors a cease and desist notice, and just you know play your cards and see what's up. Um, if you don't want to be in debt, um, then hopefully you're you know there's there are no surprises and you're able to pay. To us, if Learning about you allows us to talk to you in a way that resonates with you more, makes you feel less attacked, gives you the offer that you need earlier. Um, it works in your favor. So would you tweet at me if I was in debt by, say, WePay or Odesk and I hadn't returned calls or emails? Yeah. Would you eventually tweet at me or send me a message on Quora? This is where laws are getting really hazy, right? Uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, well, well, not hazy, but... We, sorry, you go ahead. Actually you would actually tweet and say, hey, you know, give me a call back. Uh, you owe well, me money. You can't do it publicly. It can't be a public uh, pronouncement, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can't really disclose that a person is in debt, although that's the U.S. I mean, some companies uh, I, I've learned lend money in the Philippines and then use shaming yeah. on Facebook to collect shaming. money. It's a big deal in Philippines. Mm. Absolutely. But, now, but, 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 I think, but I think they would profile you much better. So this, you know, if, for example, uh, uh, Mike, who just ran his marathon and was just two seconds short of the world record, you know, it, it'd give him uh, something to talk about and, you know, cut the ice and, you know, uh, make a connection rather mm -hmm. than just blatantly coming out. So that, that profiling would help them, you know. 
So, so you can do DMs and you can do uh, sort of any other contact through these social platforms. This is as long as there's no signaling to the public. Um, you know, uh, you could perhaps even put something on a wall and say, "Hey, I'd like to really talk to you." Is that? <laughs> oh, good. Is, is that is that cutting the edge? Because I'm not too clear about the laws uh, under the current. Because Brian, uh, you're only on Quora, but Mike and me, we are all over the place. You know. Yeah, <laughs> I stratify well, myself. So you yeah. you can do that as long as you're not pronouncing to the world that you're in the element of collecting debt, right? No, that that's problematic. Yeah, it so it is. Because it could open you up. Well, I won't go into the details because really it's legalese and it's not super interesting. But oh, gotcha. there's, a, there's a tension between telling that, noting to others that someone is in debt and being and not disclosing to the cu- customer in debt that you are a debt collector. Hmm. Oh. Oh. Oh, I get it. Right? So we always want to be open and transparent that we are indeed collecting debt. Even when we try to help you, we tell you. Yes, of course, we're still debt collecting. You have to realize that. You have but to be realize a customer that engagement to specialist, right? <laughs> right. But exactly. it, we are engaging with you. We want to help you. But here's the, here's the legal disclaimer. We are a collection company. We work for this company that you owe money to. And although we're not pressuring you now, you should know that, there, that the, the end goal of what we do is to get paid, of course. Mm. Um, but there's a difference between being very aggressive about it and shaming you and, and uh, trying to help you with the end goal of you actually being affording to pay. Look, the, our assumption is that debt happens to good people. Yeah. People want to get out of debt. They don't want to, you know, that's the majority of people. Uh, they might be angry. They might be frustrated, but they want to help and they will use whatever help we get them um, to get out of debt. Now the so angry it, issue. It, oh, go ahead. I, I just I just wanted to ask, what's your? Do you have a ratio or a comparison as to how a traditional debt collection agency is spending how many minutes on the phone versus oh yourselves? That should be interesting. I did not look into that. No, um, I I can I am certain our numbers are going to be significantly lower. Mm-hmm. I, I have a little data on that, actually. In, in, in a typical credit card debt, after it's um, been uh, uh, written off by the credit card company, mm-hmm. on average, there is between uh, 35 and 65 uh, phone calls um, for, wow. for some material result. It's a lot of phone calls. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that people just don't answer phones anymore. And mm-hmm. uh, I think, Faisal, you el- elaborated this uh, in your part of the world. Nobody leaves messages and you won't even go to your voicemail. And in some well, cases... there is no voicemail to go to. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, so in this modern context, it takes a lot of contact points. And, and like what Ohad's, the brilliance of what he has here is that in the traditional debt collection model, you have essentially only one contact point, maybe mail, but a lot of people don't even open their mail. Well, you know, you know? Uh, what, what really inspires me of what Ohad says is because in this part of the world, you know, in, in the Arab part, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, people are so, so using social media. It could really, mm-hmm. really help. Yeah. Uh, pro- profile the person and provide it back to the bank because collection agencies is, have re- haven't really taken off over here. I mean, they have, but you know, majority and of the debt debt is still connected by the bank itself. Which is but, which but, is a brilliant, but, but, right? There, there's yeah, no yeah. credit. There's no credit because there's no debt collection. Uh, so, uh, well, there's well, well, there's very little credit extended as it is, you know. Uh, so but that's but, a chicken but, or egg but, thing, right? Yeah, if you is, can't collect is. the debt adequately and you can't credit report it adequately, it's just the way the U.S. developed, right? When but, but, when uh, but, when uh, Frank McNamara put out Diners yeah. Club, there was absolutely yeah. no credit reporting agencies. It was 1980s yeah, yeah. it took to get to that. And, but 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 you know, selling the profile back, uh, not necessarily for debt collection, but for perhaps the their propensity to default or their yeah. propensity to pay back. Uh, would be something very important for uh, for a for a loaning officer or a loaning institution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I I see it, but you know I think Ohad's going to focus on one thing. But uh, you know me as excited entrepreneur here, I'm saying there's there's elements of this data. Uh, yeah, is, there's a spinoff uh, company over here, right? <laughs> there's a lot of spinoffs. <laughs> so, you know, this is just brilliance. And uh, so you Ohad, you've been in the payments world for quite a long time. Uh, can you dive into, you know, oh, going back a little further? I mean, where did it all start? You know, I know we should have done this earlier, but, you know, what got you into this? 
Well, you know, to be honest, I, I don't really think of myself as a as as a uh, payments guy. I think of myself as a data guy working in payments. There you go. Um, and that's why the transition to debt collection was very um, natural for me because I'm dealing with automating complex decisions rather than solving payments problems. Um, I, I joined Fraud Sciences very early on as the fifth, fifth employee. Wow. Um, straight out of school, actually. Um, and just, you know, you, you got to be lucky sometimes and in, in life. Fraud Sciences, they, what was their kind of lifeline? They, they grew to how much and then got acquired by PayPal so for how much? We grew to 65 people. Uh, from 2005 to 2008, we got acquired by PayPal for $170 million in 2008. Now, were you at uh, a point but, where you were able to fund your next project from that? From that, Did you have enough stake yeah. in the game? Yeah. So, well, I worked for PayPal for two and a half years, and then I left in 2010 after moving to the U.S., and I was at the point where I could work from home and, and work on a few projects, and I, I worked on Signified, uh, which is still running with two talented co-founders and um, and Analyze that got acquired by Klarna in 2011, and that was uh, that was really nice. I mean, the company got acquired. Uh, we were a small team. We had zero funding, so we had a lot of the company for ourselves. Did you ever think of jumping on board with Klarna for long term? Because they're sort of hot startup in a sense. Um, I didn't know about Klarna before they reached out to us. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, they reached out, so they took the the uh, Sequoia funding um. in middle 2010. And first time I've heard I heard about them was in August of 2010. So they were not yet a super successful international startup. They were a Nordic startup that was thinking about going places. Um, and then when they acquired us in 2011. Part of the reason that we uh, we wanted to get acquired or we agreed to get acquired is um, they got us on board to do a consulting uh, consulting gig at the end of 2010, and I spent the week there in the offices in Klarna. And every day, maybe four or five times a day, I would say, "You guys are blowing me away," because they were doing things in a way that I thought was hilarious. I mean, some people were were printing printing files to do, to do merchant onboarding, um, <laughs> like walking around with papers. And this oh my was God. a super successful company with incredible revenue, incredible prospects. So we we agreed to get acquired because we felt like what we could bring to the table is going to make Klarna a super successful company on top of what the founders did because they did an amazing job. Mm. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of, it was a process to realize that this was a huge opportunity presenting itself serendipitously out of nowhere. So now you lived in, in Sweden for a couple of years. I, yeah, I split my time between Sweden and, and San Francisco for a couple of years. Wow. Awesome. Wow. So was the big, so for you, the, the real, the real income earner, the, the place to buy a condo in San Francisco per se was from, uh, uh, fraud sciences. That was the largest acquisition you were a part of? Because you're being a part of multiple acquisitions before, I don't know, how old are you? Are you under 30? I'm 35. 35? You look young. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> that's an incredible uh, resume. I give you a lot of, lot of credit. Yeah. Very well done, sir. Very well done. Well, you know, you, you got to work hard, but you also need to be very lucky. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, we don't have time to discuss it, but, uh, but, but uh, there were macro macro uh, processes that allowed me to do what I wanted to do. So well, that dive was in a lucky. little bit. We're, we're not hard and fast because uh, I think, you know, a little bit more about your background is really interesting. I mean, what, were there signposts? Because, you know, I think most people who are really in payments aren't really in payments in the in the traditional direct sense, at least the people who are doing it cutting edge. Um, you know, uh, it just seems like you've been on this convergence path for quite some time, you know, it, it started right out of college. What was your degree? I mean, was it this uh, computer sciences degree or did it have any No, it was psychology? completely unrelated. I, I majored in biology and philosophy. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they were just, they were looking for people to, to join their, um, their analytics team. Um, this was before the days of, of data science. It used to take us uh, 24, 48 hours to train a model on, on 40,000 
uh, data points where today, I mean, you fire up a, pl- uh, a cluster, it takes 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. So we didn't really realize what we were doing at the time. Um, so are you a coder? I mean, did you learn programming or? I learned to program, but I'm, I'm, today I would be called a data scientist. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. What's your primary tool of choice? What do you what do you sit in most of your day in data science? Well, right now I'm a CEO, so you know my tool of choice is whatever <laughs> I need to do at the moment. Um, but usually, um, lately I, I've been partial on on Python and Pandas. Yeah. Uh, my team really likes Pandas. Uh, I had a <laughs> a slow a slow start, but yeah, I I code in Python usually. So you have dashboards around the company, like a lot of startups, I, I love this, they just have this real-time dashboard of what's going on and how things are, are taking off. Are you going down that road where you're just sort of able to see minute by minute what, what's going on? We have a dashboard, but really our, um, my philosophy all through the years, and it worked well with fraud sciences ever since I was hired with the same philosophy, is... We hire people who have uh, a degree and have a couple of years of experience uh, who are technical but not developers, and we teach them how to use code to do analytics. So there, our system is very bare bones in the sense that there's not a lot of permissions, there's not a lot of limitation on what a super user can do. So it's less about creating fancy, fancy visualizations, it's more about the data is available and people run analytics all the time. Now your team is what less than twenty? You said, yeah, we're sixteen people now. And then you got Robert over there, Robert Oswald. Yes. Now that guy is brilliant. Uh, how how hard was it to get him to move over? It took time, it took time. <laughs> but I think he's a, I think, he's a winner. Well, you know, yeah, Rob is amazing. Um, and I I was lucky. I mean, sometimes you just. You know, you talk to someone, it's the right time for them, it's the right time for you, um, it's, a, it's a good fit. I kind of had a hunch, not about him specifically, but generally that some of the Braintree people are going to have some shell shock after getting yeah. acquired by eBay. Uh, you know, it's always, always a little bit uh, uh, surprising when, the, uh, when corporate lands in your office. Yeah. So yeah. I, guess, I guess it was a good time. Maybe we can use that as one of your parting shots here. What's your? You've been around this for a while. What's your in uh, your insights about what you're seeing at PayPal and maybe in payments in general? I mean, obviously Apple really upset the Apple cart <laughs> for a lot of these companies, and uh, even though it, it may not directly relate to acquiring, it certainly sets a, a, a different uh, tangent. What do you feel is going to happen uh, short term? Companies like PayPal, Square, and uh, all these other companies involved. Well, you know the uh, the day Apple Pay came out, I tweeted um, that on days like these, uh, I I am happy I pivoted away from hardcore payments. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hold true. I hold true to that. I I don't know what's going to happen. I don't. Hunt, I mean, there are so many things that I think are interesting in in payments and in financial services, but I think I think the interesting things are moving away from the commerce experience. I think yeah. with PayPal and Amazon and all of these guys involved in Apple now, I mean, startups should move away from wallets, should move away from, you know, improving, reducing friction in, in e-commerce. I mean, this is the, a place for the large actors and they understand that now. We have a lot of things to do, like you said, when we started in banking infrastructure, in improving trust, in mm. improving mm. identity, in making uh, financial like services more accessible. Just like what you're doing, uh, financial profiling, you know? Okay, I, I lied. Yeah. I got one more. I got one more to ask you. Uh, Bitcoin and digital currencies are, you know, one of the biggest problems with Bitcoin as a, as a currency is the lack of trust and the lack of uh, repudiation on that. Do you see convergences with your background and your experience? Do you see convergences of creating a layer using this intelligence uh, on on these digital currencies? Uh, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in the in the platform. I'm not necessarily a big believer in the currency. Gotcha. I do own I do own Bitcoin myself, but not a lot. Um, but it's just you know as an experiment to have some skin in the game. I I am more excited about Stellar than I am about yeah. Bitcoin long term. Hmm. Stellar is amazing. Ohad, 
This has been awesome to have you on the show. Absolutely. True Accord is clearly a rocket ship. Um, is there anything else before we before we drop out that that you'd want to get the message out? Are you hiring? Are you trying to raise money? Are you looking for customers? Um, anything to throw to the masses? You know, if you are X, come to us. Well, thanks. Th- thanks for asking. Uh, I think for the for the crowd that listens to this blog, um, to this to this podcast, um, specifically, we're hiring analysts. And to go back to my point, analysts are not necessarily people who have years of experience in data science. They're technical people who are interested in technology but, and interested in being part of a startup but, uh, and are willing to learn, but don't necessarily have the formal uh, experience and are not engineers. So um, we're looking for people in San Francisco. So if you're smart and you want to get into startups and you're interested in data, you should talk to us. Clearly an awesome team, awesome company with, with repeat success and an uh, author, author of a book, just realized. Yeah, yeah, the so, rich book. Yeah. Uh, well, I, well, I've yeah. recommended that to, I recommend it to anybody to read. It is an incredible read. Awesome. Ohad, thank you very again. much, guys. Uh, thank you. Really thank it. you very much. Take care. Take, Take care. care.